What I'd like to do now is actually introduce our speaker before we have a reading of the text, and then our speaker, David Silvernail, is going to come up and offer uh, a message from God's Word to us. Dave Silvernail is a very good friend of mine, and he's a good friend of our students here at RTS. Um, he's first and foremost a churchman. He's a pastor, the senior pastor of Potomac Hills Presbyterian Church here in Leesburg. Um, he's a service to the denomination. He's been serving the denomination in a variety of ways um, on the administrative committees and in the ordinate, ordination and credentials committees of this local presbytery. And that spirit of service came out of not only who the Lord has made him to be, but out of his life experiences. He's one of those church leaders who sort of cut his teeth in service as serving in the United States Army. And he served in both active duty and in reserve capacities. And it's there that he learned how to lead people. He learned leadership. He learned how to be a, thing, a part of a thing that's bigger than yourself. And I think it was a great training and preparation for the service that he would then offer to the church. He teaches pastoral theology for us here at RTS Washington, and so he's influenced many of our students in the way that they preach and teach and articulate God's word, and he does it from that spirit of servant leadership. And so it's my joy to have David Silvernail with us here this morning to speak to us um, out of God's word. So with that said, let me hand it over to Dr. Paul Jean, who's going to bring the reading for us today. Good morning, friends. <clears throat> the reading today comes from Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. Let me read this on our behalf. Now, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple, asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While he clung to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astounded, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. This is the word of the Lord. Well, it's been a long time coming. So today you're going to get a little bit of a sermon and a little bit of commentary, and a little bit of counsel. And uh, hopefully at the end it all makes sense. But let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, this is your word, and we need it this day, even more than we needed it yesterday. So thank you for giving us the scriptures and making us your people. Lord, today we come to a story of seeking mercy and giving mercy. So we pray that we would take it seriously, learn its lessons carefully, and find the one who heals souls as well as bodies. Thank you that today we're learning from St. Luke, the inspired writer of his gospel and the book of Acts. Help us to hear his words, understand them, believe them, and obey them, and so we pray, speak through Acts 3 on this special day, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, help us see Jesus. For in his name we pray, amen and amen. Well, it has been a most interesting year. The pandemic changed everything. And as I started to think about what I wanted to say today, 
I thought about all the changes we've had to face, all the issues we've had to address, and all the contentiousness that we've had to put up with. By any stretch, it's been a difficult year. <clears throat> and as I think back to what we've been through, I remember that when the pandemic started, we were still dealing with the difficult issues presented by the Me Too movement, which included the She Too movement and the Church Too movement, <coughs> forced us to address the many concerns surrounding the mistreatment of women. And so those of us who are pastors and ministry leaders had to become experts in the right caring for women. It's a good thing. It's a very good thing. Of course, that issue gave way to the pandemic itself. And all of a sudden, we had to become epidemiologists and biochemists. And I distinctly remember zero seminary courses on mitigating the spread of contagious diseases. So we had to create rules on masks and distancing and sanitizing and how to do church when you can't meet. And those of us who are pastors and ministry leaders had to become experts on pandemic management. A good thing. Maybe a very good thing. Of course, that new reality forced us to become audiovisual technicians, another topic I don't remember in seminary. And we bought tripods and special mics and video cameras and started a YouTube channel and we learned about recording speeds and video editing and how ridiculously long it takes to upload videos. And so those of us who are pastors and ministry leaders had to become experts in how to do digital ministry and online church. Not a bad thing, maybe a good thing, not sure. Of course, the summer gave way to social unrest and brought the complex issue of racial reconciliation to the forefront. Yet another topic I don't remember in seminary although a topic I knew a little something about from my military service. And we had to learn about issues of justice and issues of privilege and issues of discernment. As many very good things were said and written and posted and many less good things were said and written and posted. And so those of us who are pastors and ministry leaders had to become experts on racial reconciliation, a good thing, a very good thing. Of course, the fall arrived like a hurricane with the hyper-polarization of partisan politics. And we discovered that a number of our people who loved each other on Sunday morning couldn't stand each other the rest of the week. Did you see what he posted? Did you read her comments? Well, how can they even be saved if they think like that? And so those of us who are pastors and ministry leaders had to become experts on the theology of public life. Yet another topic I don't remember in seminary, although this seminary does offer teaching on that topic. And that's a good thing, a very good thing. And I could go on, but I think you get the picture. Most of you are gonna become pastors and ministry leaders, speaking just to the graduates now. And you'll have to become experts on a whole lot of things you never thought you'd have to learn for the ministry. And they're all good things, even very good things. But what haven't I mentioned? Preaching, teaching, worship. You know those other things that we all thought we'd have to know in order to have a successful ministry. And herein lies the great danger. Because in your desire to become an expert on all of these good things, you can forget the first things. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 and 4, for I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with with the scriptures that he was buried that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures Jesus is of first importance all those other things I mentioned are good valuable necessary and important things 
And all of them can cause you to forget what is of first importance. And that's the person and work of our Lord Jesus Christ. And to see how that works out, we're going to go to my all-time favorite passage of Scripture, the book of Acts, chapter 3. Before we jump in, let's do a quick review. There are three major themes in the book of Acts. The first theme concerns the sending of the Holy Spirit. The second theme concerns the sending of the church. And the third theme concerns the sending of the gospel. But all of those serve the purpose of pointing to Jesus. The Spirit of Christ sends the Church of Christ with the Gospel of Christ because the book of Acts is all about Christ. And so the church started meeting regularly for learning and fellowship and worship and to tell others about Jesus. And starting with today's passage, that's exactly what they do. And so in Acts 3, we see what a Spirit-filled church gives. The Apostolic Church had not yet broken with the temple, and so, as with all devout Jews, Peter and John continued their attendance at the designated times of prayer. This time of day is the busiest of the prayer times, and so they're part of this large throng moving into the temple, beginning with Acts 3, verse 1. Now, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, and a man lame from birth was being carried whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate to ask alms of those entering the temple. So as Peter and John move along with the flow of the crowd, they providentially encounter a beggar being carried to his usual post. He's been disabled all of his life. He had to be carried everywhere he went. His begging post is one of the best spots in the city because it's at the beautiful gate, which was about 75 feet tall. Its frame was overlaid with Corinthian bronze. It had great double doors with thick plates of silver and gold. And what a compelling sight the helpless beggar made against the backdrop of such lavish surroundings. Here is this truly magnificent gate, and seated next to it is a man who, at least in that day and time, no one would call magnificent. The contrast had to be stunning. It is the perfect place to solicit funds. And so the man's uh, position at the entrance to the temple, the center of Israel's religious life, would have the potential to make him a lot of money. And then a God thing happens. Starting at verse 3. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. They hadn't even gotten to the gate yet. This man catches sight of Peter and John, and they look like good prospects. So he begins his mechanical beggar's wail, which undoubtedly repeated thousands of times. Gentlemen, just a few coins, please. He asked for what was valued by the world. He asked for money. This man had given up hope for healing, so he was settling for money. And he'd probably been told many times, you have no hope. You'll never amount to anything. Just look at you. Why don't you just go out and beg? Maybe then you'll be able to get by. But money's not what this man needed. He needed salvation for his soul and healing for his heart, and money can't buy those things. Now, Peter and John could have ignored him and just kept walking, like so many of us have done. It is a critical test of Peter's own faith. He had to choose. He must have asked himself, how would Jesus respond? Would Jesus heal this man? Can we do that? He made us apostles and told us could, that we could do that, but dare we try. It's rubber meets the road time for the apostle Peter. And Peter needed to have faith just as much as that beggar needed to have faith. And so Peter chooses decisively, and he responds, look at us. And the beggar looks expectantly, and Peter said, I have no silver or gold. Perhaps the beggar began to frown. 
Perhaps he thought he was being mocked. But then came these immortal words in one of the most meaningful and powerful of scripture verses. I memorized this in the NIV years and years ago, and that's how I still hear it. Silver or gold I do not have, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. You see, what they had to give, healing and new life in Christ, was highly valued by God. It was greater than all the silver and gold on those gates around them. They knew what they had to offer would change this man's life. In effect, what they were saying to him was, we don't have the money to keep you in your present condition, but we have something to get you out of this condition. And this is hugely important even today. It is not the business of the church in this world to make a miserable situation a little less miserable. It's the business of the church to bring the redemptive work of Jesus Christ to those for whom he died, healing not just for the body, but for the soul. Because the healing didn't come from Peter, but from Christ. Just look at the command, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. You ever wonder why Peter included that last part of Nazareth? We can't be sure, but John 19 tells us what was on the sign that Pontius Pilate attached to Jesus' cross. And Peter wanted everyone to be sure that he was representing the one who had been crucified. And Peter left no doubt as to the power and authority of the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And the command to walk is accompanied by the power to walk. Luke is very careful to make sure we get the full impact of what happened, verses 7 and 8. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with him, walking and leaping and praising God. The man knew he couldn't walk, so he didn't budge. And then Peter, doing a very typical Peter thing, grabs him by the right hand and begins to hoist him up. Hey, buddy, you're healed. At that moment, the text says, immediately, everything comes together. And Luke emphasizes the man's new ability. Four times in this chapter, it says he walked. Not only did he walk, but twice it tells us that he jumped, as if he were testing out his new ability. And that's amazing. Even today, if you spend a few months in the hospital, you have to take time to learn how to walk again. This man walked immediately, and he had never walked before. Sometimes we miss the drama and the significance of miracles like this one because we don't allow our imagination to catch the fact that it happened instantly. In Matthew 12, we read that one Sabbath, Jesus told the man with a withered hand to reach out his hand, and as he did, his hand was healed. That hand was crippled, and before everyone's eyes, it became whole. In Matthew 8, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, we learn of a leper who came through the crowd crying, unclean, unclean. The man's covered with leprosy. He had grotesque features, and Jesus heals him in full view of the people. And the man's eyebrows grew back and his face took shape and his hair and vocal cords were made whole and he was healed right before their eyes. So it is with this text. The man is healed in a flash. The text says, and leaping up, he stood and began to walk. Now think about that. Maybe it was a tentative step at first followed by some longer, steady steps. And he's saying to himself, I can't believe it. I'm walking. I can jump. And he begins hopping and leaping around the temple. The text says he's leaping and praising God with a volume not appropriate for most PCA church services. He's shouting, hallelujah, praise God, I've been healed. It's a beautiful scene. The time that Isaiah had prophesied about had arrived. Isaiah 35 says, And the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped, and then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. 
for waters break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert, and the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Peter and John have the example of Christ in Matthew 11, uh, 5, when he told the disciples to take the report to John the Baptist and to tell him the blind receive their sight and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear and the dead are raised up and the poor have good news preached to them. And they saw Jesus perform this same kind of healing himself in John 5 when he told the crippled man at the pool of Beth uh, Bethesda to get up Take up your bed and walk. You see, what Peter and John did is a continuation of what Jesus had done. They went to the temple and continued Jesus' ministry. They preached the good news of new life in Christ. They taught all who were interested, and they healed the sick. And they did it right under the nose of the religious establishment, just as Jesus had done. And they had the evidence of their own changed lives. In the early part of the Gospels, they're referred to as Peter and Andrew, James and John, rarely Peter and John together. They're different ages, different backgrounds, different personalities. And yet they're no longer competing for greatness, but faithfully working together to build the church. And this guy won't let go of him. Look at verses 9 and 11, Acts 3. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Verse 11, while he clung to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astonished, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. What does the spirit-filled church give? It gives what it has. Notice again, silver or gold I do not have, but what I have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. There is a spiritual truth here. You can only give what you have. That's what Peter and John had, and that's what they gave. They gave what they had. They gave Jesus. How do we know that? Look with me in the next chapter, Acts 4, verse 13. Now when they, the members of the council, saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. They could give Jesus because Jesus is what they had. They could give the power of Christ because they were full of Christ. The Spirit-filled church gives what it has. And it still gives healing. This miracle is both literal and parable because the spirit-filled church dispenses more than care for the body. It brings healing to the soul. In place of spiritual lameness, there can be leaping. Think of those you know who are like this beggar. Maybe it's their spirit that's crippled. Maybe they have relationships that have been crippled. Maybe they've given up hope and they're just trying to get by. People still need to be healed. They need to be healed physically. They need to be healed emotionally. They need to be healed spiritually. And when we preach and teach and give Christ, then we'll discover that very good things still happen. Because what a spirit-filled church gives is Jesus. We give what we have. So let's go back to where we started. It's inevitable that you are going to get out in ministry. And you are going to be asked to become an expert on human sexuality, on pandemic management, on digital ministry, on social justice, and damage control from political polarization. And none of that is going away. But to be honest, this year is not all that different from past years. Back then, you may have been in asked to be an expert uh, counselor on failed marriages, an expert on building construction, an expert on ministry development. That's a euphemism for raising lots of money. The reigning expert on conflict management or a religious entrepreneur. All of them good things. Some very good things. And then, as now, lies the great danger. Preaching, teaching, worship, you know, 
the other things, can become secondary things. And it's easy to forget the first things. For I deliver to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Jesus is of first importance. You can't give Jesus unless you have been with Jesus. So that's my word for you as you head out into the world of vocational ministry. Be with Jesus, no matter what. Become an expert on being with Jesus as a matter of first importance. Because the main thing you have to offer the church, the main thing you have to offer the world, is Jesus. And you can't give what you don't have. You need to pray. Take a moment to do that and then I'll close. Let's pray. Our Lord and our God, thank you that you have spoken to us by your Son. Open our eyes that we might see our sin and then see our Savior. We confess there are times when we fail to see those who need mercy. And there are times when we fail to be those who seek your mercy. Lord, we confess there are times when we give the physical things we have, but not the spiritual things, not the things of first importance, not Jesus. And so we thank you for him, the one who has mercy on undeserving beggars like us. Thank you for the one who has made a curse for us, the one who bears all our sin on the cross, the one who redeems us by his blood, shed for many for the remission of sins, turning his curse into our blessing for the salvation of our souls. Help us who have fled for refuge to the cross so that we might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us and work in each of us this year as we lead people to live with Peter and Luke and John and the other biblical writers, as we learn to be people who embody what I have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk or pray or love or listen or live in Jesus' name. Teach us to respond with a greater trust in you and in your word and through the power of the Holy Spirit draw us ever closer to the one who has delivered to us as of first importance what we also receive, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Your son, our savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one of first importance who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.